Okay, it's time to get started. And there is um, two things. One is I was told about a week ago that people think I'm retiring at the end of the year, which was news to me. Um, you always have to know, right? So as far as I know, I'm not retiring at the end of the year unless other people get plans for me. And the second thing is, we get started, we need to have a mid, you know, infamous midterm. Um, so we will. Make sure it's the right. Last Thursday of October. What's that? Bad luck. Halloween. Halloween. No. <laughs> well, I guess it's the appropriate date then, right? <laughs> You know, it's important to keep in mind that when we go through these design patterns, you know, we it, we call ourselves computer scientists, right? Um, but a lot of what we do is is, is more of engineering, I think. Um, we build things, right? We build software, and when we're doing so, we're always making choices: do I do it this way, or do it that way, right? And the question is. When, you, when you're faced with choices, you have to ask yourself, you know, what are the benefits and drawbacks of each choice? Because sometimes choice A might be the right choice. In other situations, choice B might be the right choice, right? So on the way over here, a student is asking about the state pattern. Um, like, why use a state pattern? Um, well, again, it depends on the situation, right? In the state pattern, we can always replace the state pattern with if statements, right? You know, if we have some sort of variable that tells us what state is, if state equals zero, then do this. If state equals one, do this, right? And so the question becomes, what are the benefits and drawbacks of each each option, right? Um, and so part of the question becomes, how many places does that case statement appear, right? Well, that's, if it appears once, then we're done, right? It's good. I mean, um, if, it's, if it starts appearing in multiple places, you know, then it becomes harder. When you want to introduce more different states, we have to then find all those places. And so if, if it only occurs in one spot, then when at you know a fourth case or a fifth case, well you go there and you had another case, right? If it appears, you know, in ten different places, now we want to add a new case, we have to then go and find them all ten of them. Right? Whereas if it's in the state pattern, you add a new state, what do you do? You add a new subclass, and then at some point you have to figure out how do you trans how to change from one state to the other. And that's context sensitive, right? In your current assignment, but if I now modify the assignment, so you need four different states, you know, how, how would we add those states? Well, it's gonna be like, you add two more buttons, right? Um, so that part's easy, and then it's just a matter of you know, whether it makes sense to use a state pattern or to use case statements is how contained are those case statements? They occur in one method in one class, not worth it, right? Um, if it occurs in multiple methods in one class, um, yeah, all of a sudden it might be, because now we have, well, a set of several benefits. One is, instead of having to look at, you know, 10 different methods to see what happens when we're in case one, and then 10 minutes we have in case two, it's like, oh, here's all, 
here's what we do in case one, here's what we do in case two, here, right? So it becomes easier to understand a single case. Um, and it becomes easier to introduce new states. And so which one's appropriate? It, again, it depends upon um, how many states you have, what's the probability of adding more states in the future, and how many places, how many, how much behavior in different places that do the states affect. What if it's only used in one place, but it means like behavior? Yeah, again, it's, so it's, it's always a trade-off, right? It's like, yes, itself, okay. Um, if the statement only occurs, the case statement occurs in one place, um, there's still many reasons to use the, the state pattern. But now, instead of having it in one spot, you've got different cases located in Well, if it's one if statement, one case statement, then the entire logic is right here, right? And 107, 108 students can understand if statements and case statements. You hand them the state pattern, they're gonna be like, what? Right, so it's, you know, if it's one case statement, I will claim it, in general, it's easier to understand. Now, necessarily, because it depends on what you, you know, then, you know, if each case in that case statement is 15 lines long and you put them in line and you've got, and all of a sudden it's like hard to read, but then of course you have separate methods, but so it, my general argument is you have to ask yourself what are the benefits and drawbacks, right? I'm doing it this way and that way. And that's always the case, right? I mean, when we're developing software, I mean, and of course, the most interesting thing is usually when you start a project, you don't know enough about the project, right? And then then you work on and work on and When you're almost done with the software, it's like, I finally know enough about the project to actually start the project, right? Because the problem is to write the software, you need to know the system in such fine detail, right? You can't, how, how do you get that that level of fine detail knowledge without actually going through the steps of figuring it out and writing the software? It can be done, right, but it's. Yeah, I mean, it's, <clears throat> it seems like the goal is to make it so that, like when I, when I've been doing this and not knowing what's in the future, you wanna make it so that if this piece changes a lot, Everything else, right, right. right. It just kind of refines it. Right. It becomes that. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's when the holy grail of software development, right, is to be able to do that. And, you know, probably next week or the way after, we'll start talking about coupling and cohesion. Or we'll talk about two ideas related to that. You know, we want, we don't want things we tightly coupled so a change over here affects changes over there. So any questions? So you're either almost done with assignment two, so there's no questions, or you're so lost in assignment two, you're not quite sure what to ask. How do I get sleep? Well, sometimes if you half this way and half that way, right? <laughs> they overlap. Or you can get, you know, not a paperclip, but a, um, 
Yeah, when I was, yeah. Right. They can get pretty big, right? Mm -hmm. Future assignments are not likely to be as complicated. This one. What? This one. Sorry. Sorry more. <laughs> no, the goal is that this assignment and all further assignments will be equally weighted to match out the total weight for the assignment. And of course, one of the goals of this assignment is um, to use the patterns. That's, that's an important part of the, of the assignment. Um, some more patterns. Um, the decorator pattern. Some of you may have come across these um, little toy dolls from Russia, where they open up and there's another one inside to keep on going until there's um, so that sort of describes the decorator pattern. And the goal is to add responsibilities, individual objects dynamically and transparently. Dynamically means at runtime, I can add things that, you know, add more responsibilities to an object at runtime. And transparently means the rest of the code doesn't doesn't have to know or change to take that into effect, right? It's just, oh, that's just a foo object. It's still a foo object. Um, and so the structure of the decorator pattern is. Again, there's a top level interface that they call a component. Um, and then there is a subclass, which is the actual object that we're going to decorate. And then we have other subclasses. There's a decorator interface. Um, and then we can have separate decorators. And a decorator has a reference to a component. Um, so then, you know, basically what you do is we create our component object, and then if we want to add responsibilities to it, we put it inside of a decorator and pass the decorator around as a component, which requires us to then in our code only um, Define types to be of type component, not of concrete component. And then we can, once we do that, we can add as many decorators as we want. And since we're composing them, we can do this at runtime. So we can, depending on conditions, we can add decorators or not add decorators or different decorators. Um, And then, um, you know, each decorator has to have, have to implement the same interface so it implements all the same operations as, right? And then when it, you call an operation on it, you may do some work beginning and then pass it on to get the answer back and do some extra work. Um, Right. 
So in this case, I stole the examples um, from a different source, um, Wikipedia. Um, and so their coffee example is, you want to compute the cost of coffee and you've got, well, you have Starbucks now, right? And there's coffee and then you can add all this other stuff, right? And the different types of stuff you can use and different prices. And so this example only has you know, the base price of coffee and cost of milk and sprinkles. Um, and so then using a decorator pattern, we can build our interface, right, of coffee. And we, we can add a couple methods, get cost and get ingredients. Um, and then the base coffee class, right? I mean, it turns the cost, right? And the ingredients is coffee. And now to use a decorator pattern, um, we create a, a coffee decorator, which implements coffee, right? And it has a reference to the actual coffee object or a coffee decorator. Um, and then we can um, use abstract methods. And then our milk decorator, um, well, the cost is whatever cost is down the line plus 50 cents for milk. What are the ingredients? Well, whatever the ingredients are plus milk, right? Simple enough, right? It's just basically. And once you see this as a coffee decorator, now the sprinkles decorator becomes obvious, right? It's just, now, did I do sprinkles? Well, I didn't do it because all you do is the get cost is whatever the super cost is plus um, whatever I said sprinkles cost. And then the ingredients are whatever the ingredients down the chain are plus sprinkles. And then you know, I create a coffee and then I can um, add milk and add sprinkles and each time I can print out, I can get the cost and get the ingredients. And then if we want to add some other feature, right? We just add another decorator class for that feature and the cost and then and the customer orders and you press the cash register button it, Right, we chain each together and then with the total cost, well, ask for the cost and then the, and the decorators forward the request to the very bottom, get the base cost plus all the additionals and then we're done, right? Now the problem with the example is it's a very simple, simplistic example, right? Um, and they're ignoring lots of details which are important. Um, well, the prices change, right? Um, new extras, seasonal extras. Um, and how's all, all that, I mean, Cash registers now, they don't just, you don't, they're not typing the price, right? They're typing in milk and this type, you know, so cash register has all the options. And when the options change, the cash register display has to change, right? 
Um, so there's a lot of details that need to be delved into to make this example real or semi-real. Um, and if we're doing functional programming, then we can just have the same effect by having this chaining functions, right? Um, but of course, enclosure, the parentheses are outside, not in after the argument. So it look like this. Um, yeah, I take I mean, People complain about this, it's like there's so many parentheses in the list and those people say, but you know, you just take a regular function like this and you move the parentheses out and you get the same number of parentheses, so what's the problem? Um, the main problem is that usually you don't nest things like that, right? You don't get that big long. Um, well, so, there's a common pattern, so in functional programming and enclosure, we can actually take the base functions and there's a, a compose function which takes these functions and returns a function which just chains them together, like basically to do that. And so now I can just call sprinkles milk and then it, it base price then milk, right? So we can. But it's sort of the same idea, right? We've got this, we start with a base function and then we can, and if you only have got one operation we're dealing with, then this works just as well as the decorator pattern. But if the operation is like five or 10 or 20 operations on the base class, now we have to do the chaining, you know, 10 or 20 times in the functional programming world. Um, and then there's also, Another way of doing this, we can actually, um, what this says is take the amount and then pass the amount here and then pass it in the base price and take the result of base price and pass it in the milk and then pass it in the sprinkles and then we can call this chain together. And that eliminates the long list of, right? And it's also easy to read because we read from left to right, and the other example goes from right to left, right? And so this just goes from top to bottom, which is okay. Um, so the basic idea um, of the decorator pattern is we see both in functional programming and object-oriented programming, right? And this is such a common thing to do. They have, they have several different constructs in the language to help us out. Right, it's basically, yeah, pass the mountain a base price and the output, right. Now, are there any Unix gurus? Everyone's a Windows person. Yeah. Of course, what you'd really do is you'd create, you'd create maps, right? And we'd have one map for the prices, one map for the order, and then we would have a function to compute it. It's just that you have to keep in mind that these very simple examples are there just to give you the basic idea, right? Um, in most cases, you would never use the pattern in that case, in that example, because it's too simplistic. Um, and so this is this is right an example of favoring composition over inheritance, right? Because we're going to compose our decorators one on top of each other, and the reason to do that is it gives us runtime flexibility. Um, and this pattern, right, it 
it separates out the the basic core functionality and the embellishments. Right. Uh, liabilities. Um, well, we have to be careful because now you have to make sure that we program to the that top interface, right, and not the actual concrete thing. Um, uh, how to understand debug? Uh, um, so, in one version of Smalltalk, I, I've done a fair amount of work. Um, they use decorators to do with the windows, right? You have a basic window, but then you need a scroll bar, right? Oh, so the scroll bar becomes a decorator. Oh, then you need another decorator for the scroll bars the other way, so another decorator. And so we actually build up a, a real usable window. You've got this long chain of decorators. Now if something goes wrong, it's like, oh, where's my window? Oh, no, no, that's the decorator, 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 decorator. There's the window. Now, how does that work? Oh, but now you have to understand, right, this whole chain. So it does, um, it did make life more, it made life easier for designers because then, okay, here's the core functionality window. Don't worry about scrolls. Don't worry about this or offsets or any of that stuff. Just window display stuff, right? Zero, zero, start there. Now, oh, it's too big. So now we have a decorator to, shift things around, right? Oh, you want scroll bars, another decorator, right? So all these things had different decorators. So it, it was really nice because then it's like, here's windowing systems are complicated enough, right? So we'll have to about scrolling and shifting and scaling and all that sort of stuff made it much easier to write the core functionality of a window. And then we could just slowly add, you know, create decorators to get everything we need. Right. Yeah. But, but yeah, so the, but then you have basically a decorator that contains a bunch of smaller decorators, right? Smaller object. Smaller object, but still to understand what's going on, you, you then oh, hit this thing and then there's a bunch of... Yeah, it just makes it more of a tree instead of a chain. Well, it would still have to act like a tree on a chain because when I send a message to it, it has to go through all the decorators, right? So yeah, you, you could configure, okay, here's, you know, send me three common scenarios. I want a scroll bar, right, horizontal scroll vertical scroll bar and I want to be able to scale and I want to be able to shift things around, right? Okay. And so we could create another decorator which is a composite of those decorators. But the composite would still have to send, right, message through all of them to make sure it all works. Yeah, but the tree structure assumes that you might might be a path where you diverge, right? The decorators we needed to all go through each each one, right? And depending upon the situation, the order might matter. It seems like every possible permutation. It depends upon the situation. If we're talking about windows, right? Um, if we've got a scaling factor and a rotation factor and a translation factor, those three, if you do them in different order, you get different results, right? Because if you translate first, then rotate uh, those two, or I rotate then trans, I mean, I get different results. Of the and the mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so, so depending on the situation, the order may matter, right? And the simple example of the coffee, 
British competing price, and it's hard to imagine where how the order would have would matter, right? So um, in the book, it's talking about streams, Java stream, but our streams in Java is that an example of decorating? Do we add another decoration to it? Or map? Yeah, so we'll talk about that in a minute. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah it'll, it'll come up with the next one. Well, um, so chain responsibility is going to look very similar to the decorator pattern, right? Um, so we have a handler, right? Um, interface and then it, it passes the message on the request on to the next one um, and you have a bunch of handlers and you can pull them together now one difference is right in general in the chain responsibility right you know one of the one of the handlers will deal with it I'm, you know, so I make like okay, it's not not my job to handle this request. So I pass it on. Now my job, pass it on. Oh, yeah, that's me. I'll do with it, and then I'll return the answer. Right. So in general, only one handler does the rest of the request. Um, but of course, then then to make the object up, we we compose a bunch of handlers together define what that thing should do, right? And the problem of now, of course, is that if each handler says, oh, no, not me, I, I pass on the next guy, if you're not careful, none of them will handle that case, and the last guy will say, it's not me, and there's no one to ha have, handle off to, so bye. Or they'll try to pass it on, right, and then there's nobody there. All right, so not guaranteed the request to be handled is like yeah. yeah. Well, it definitely is right. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it may be that you in that case you don't, you don't want nothing to happen, right? Well, but each remember each handler basically handles basically one case, right, or one situation, and then you compose them together to. You know, some examples of where the idea comes. From. In a, in a language, um, you know, in Java, right, you, there's an object just on top, right, and you get subclasses, right? And so when I call request a method on bar, what do you do? I mean, does bar handle it or not? If the answer is yes, we're done, right? If the answer is no, then you look at the super, this parent class and say, does it have the method or not? If the answer is yes, we're done, right? Otherwise, we go, right. What happens if the object doesn't handle it? Well, in the Java world, the compiler checks at a runtime, or compiler time to make sure that some place in the chain handles it, right? In small talk, it's like, oh, no, it's in a runtime, and if you get to the top and no one handles it, there's a exception rate saying, I'm sorry, but Right, so this is, and of course, it does become a tree, right? Because there are lots of subclasses object, and those subclasses have other subclasses, right? So you get this huge tree. Yeah, so all of a sudden it's, 
is that the chain of responsibility of the decorator, right? Because we're starting to meld the two, and, and the decorator would say, oh, you know, the, the request will go to the, the end object and come back again, right? And then in between, we can modify the request or modify the answer, right, in some way. Um, Right, and chain of builder is saying, okay, one one will handle it. But now it's like, okay, super, so two people get involved or three people get involved, right? But it doesn't, go, it won't necessarily go to the very end and come back again. At some point it will stop. Yeah. Um, Another example is context help. Um, so often in an application you say, you know, give me help for this piece, right? And then depending on what the question is, right, just like, okay, there's what the button does and then the, the, the pain is in and then, right? And so, it, you know, the button may be able to handle it or Right. If it can't handle it, it can pass it on to the print dialog and the dot. Right. And so once, at some point, either the request is not handled at all, say, I'm sorry, but we don't know. Or we say, okay, here's the answer to, here's what we think the answer is to your, your question. So here, right, each, each component either handles it or it passes it on to the next thing. And once it's handled, we're done. We don't. So the example of the chain of responsibility. Well, I use Apple Mail and Apple Mail, you can have filters and you create a bunch of filters, right? And and so when the email comes in, it's passed, I mean, the first filter and the second filter, right? Until one of them handles it, and then we're done. Right, another example where, again, we, we can pull them dynamically, but at any point, any point in time, I can now add another filter, right? Yeah, a bunch of some other examples. Um, this one's sort of interesting. The Apache Common Chain, it really is just implementation of chain responsibility. Gives you a framework to build these chains up and then that's it. Which in the name says it's a chain. Windows too, in my mind, it seems like even the even the big frameworks that can build yeah. on it. Always, you know, can you handle this? If not, pass it to your parent. Right. Eventually, it goes to that default window, which is kind of your catch-all. Right. Yeah, and then once someone handles it, well, at least in the systems I've used, the event goes to some object, right? And either it handles it or it doesn't. But it returns true or false, right? And if it returns true, then it says I've handled it. So it can cheat by returning false. It can do something and then pass it on, right? <laughs> so it, it's sort of like your example of a find, you know, calling a method on an object, right? You, you do have the ability of sort of cheating and saying, okay, I'm going to handle it, but I'm I'm going to not tell anyone and then pass it on. Yeah, but not not like, like the, right. Couldn't handle it. Right. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. 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 Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> B 
so you actually see examples where we do this, right? Where there is a chain, and one person, one element in the chain is going to deal with it, and you know, it gives you the ability to dynamically create that chain, right? We don't build it in our source code necessarily. So why why is it so strict? It can't, you know, I mean, why doesn't it allow for more of a hybrid? It's chain of responsibility, but I'm gonna modify it a little bit before I have There's nothing wrong with that. Right? Um Again, patterns aren't like algorithms, right? And algorithms are like, this is quick short, right? And you basically, every text where you go is like, this is quick short, and it's, it's all the same. Patterns give you this basic idea, and then you modify it to your context, right? And for me, the idea is, it gives you a catalog of possible solutions, right? And it's like, okay, this fits pretty well, but not quite. So how can we tweak it to satisfy our our current needs? But if you assume that they have more experience, if people wrote the patterns with more experience, more data, should you question yourself and go? Well, they, when you talk to patterns people, they even say, yeah, patterns are meant to be modified to fit, fit the context. Um, now, of course, you have to ask yourself, okay, you know, what, what are the effects of my modification? Is it good or bad, right? There'll be some negative and some positive effects, right? And presumably, and if you're a good engineer, then it's like, oh, you're going to take, take that into account and modify it so the pattern works better in this context than it was if you weren't, as opposed to making things worse. Right. I, you know, once, I guess I teach a course called Client Server Programming. Um, and for a couple of years, this class and that course are taught in the same semester. Which, and so I get students in both. And so once I had this student um, taking both, and of course, in a client server program, at some point, I haven't built a client and a server, right? Um, and servers are a bit more complicated, but you get through about concurrency and threading and handling requests and talking to database. And, um, so there's one student in particular is like, both classes, and we talk about a pattern, and then he's working on a server. Oh, I can use that pattern here. Oh, I can use that pattern here. I can use this pattern here, right? Um, and at some point, instead of being, oh, I can use this pattern here, like, oh, I can use this pattern here. Um, he used too many patterns, right? And his code just got so complicated because he's all these different patterns. He actually never finished it which was disastrous for the course. It was like, I mean, one of your assignments, you can't finish your, one of your major assignments is not a good sign. But he just used too many patterns and applied them too many places, right? And the code got so hard to deal with, it was so flex, I mean, it was so convoluted, but there were too many patterns. Now, another example, um, loggers, right? Um, but there's, where do you want the logs to go? Well, in production, you probably want them going to a file, right? And of course, that, that file may have a different machine, right? So it may have a, this whole, but when you're debugging, you don't want them to go to the file, but it's like, you know, where are they, right? 
you, you want the file too, but it's like, okay, show me on the screen what's going on, right? Um, and then you also may want to be notified that something went wrong, right? And even in production, like having it, that go to a file doesn't help us because if something really went bad, um, we need to know now because we need to f figure out what went wrong and try and fix it, right? So maybe you want, right? So we have different types of debuggers, right? We want to go to uh, debugging, one go to um, email, one go to standard error, maybe another one go to file, right? Into the file system. And then we can start, right? Just chain them together. You want just one, then okay, just go to the file. You want go to standard out and do file and combine them together, right? But of course, this starts to violate the pattern a bit, right? Because in this case, you're always passing it on. You're always you're passing it on. It. Right, you're always passing it on, right? So is this chain responsibility or is it decorator? Right, because it, right? In the decorator, the pattern goes all the way to the bottom, right? And they all may do something to it. Now, you know, I'll skip over this, but yeah, is it is it the chain responsibility, right? Because we you're passing it on each time. There's a related concept um, which people call object oriented recursion. Now, regular recursion is you have a function, right? And it calls itself. And, but somehow the input becomes smaller in some way, right? And, and at some point, the, we get down to our base case, and okay, here's our base case, and then the recursion unwinds and we, we solve the problem, right? Now, object oriented recursion is slightly different because we're not calling this as the same function, we're calling the same function on, a, on another object. So it's foo, 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 right? But each time it's a different object, and eventually we reach the end of that chain of foods and then we you know, unwind it, right? Like recursion. So in regular recursion, right, the argument changes, but in abnormal recursion, the receiver changes the same, the same method, right? So I wanna give an example. Um, so I have a linked list, right? And of course, in linked lists, there's always a special case. The special case is, oh, there's no nodes, right? And the other case is there's one node. And you've all done this, right? There's like, oh, if empty, do this. If one node, do this. Otherwise, do that, right? So one way to get rid of those special cases is to say, there's always going to be two nodes have a head node and a tail node, right? So now I don't have to worry about those two special cases and the head node is gonna act like a head node. Um, and so let's say here I have my list and it's got a three and a seven and I wanna be able to just print things out. Um, so I, I send a two message to the, the head node and the head node is okay, well, I'm just a head node, I don't get any value. And so I'll, I'll print out, I'll add the beginning parentheses and then ask the next node to do all the rest and I'll combine them together and return it, right? And then it goes to this next node and it's a regular node and it's okay, well, I'll put a space so things look nice and then I'll um, add my element and then I'll add whatever is after me, right? And then it goes to seven, you know, the seven and the same thing. Okay, I'm going to, right, put a space and I'm going to put my thing and I'll return ask next thing. And then the tail node says, well, I'm at, I'm at the very end and I don't have any, I don't, 
have any data, so I can just put then parentheses, right? <coughs> and so I'm calling to a string and everything, right? And it starts in, it goes all the way to the bottom and comes all the way back, and here's your string that gives a string representation of that. So it's sort of like recursion, and we're calling to a string to a string, but it's not like regular recursion because it's, well, in this case, there's no argument, but the receiver changes, right? But like regular recursion, eventually there has to be an end to this thing, otherwise we go on forever, and then that's our base case, like, and then we unwind the whole thing and we get our answer back. So far, so good? Um, you know, another example doing the same thing. I mean, now I want to add something to a linked list. Um, so what do I do? Well, what does the head node do when when you get an add method? Well, it's like okay, I just um, I'm a head node, so I'm always first, so nothing gonna be for me, so I'm going to ask that whatever comes after me to add this thing, right? And then, oh, if it's a regular node, it's gonna say, well, you know, do you belong before or after me? Are you larger or smaller? If you're if you're smaller, then I'll put you, I'll add you before me, otherwise I'll ask you the next thing to add you. And the tail node is like, well, okay, if the request gets to me, um, you belong before me because I'm the tail, I was at the end, right? The yeah, only, it's done, right? But when I do the two string method, it goes all the way, right, right. If I have a contains method, it's going to well. The contains method, well, what we do is on the tail node, it's going to hand, it's going to respond to all messages, right, in some way. So it's not quite the chain responsibility, pure chain responsibility. In that it's possible chain responsibility, and no one handles it. Um, you know, tail is always going to handle every method that comes to do, it'll do something appropriate. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the responsibility has the guys Not necessarily. No. Right? So, so in some cases it looks like a chain of responsibility, otherwise it's just, right? Um, and so now I got three similar things that um, the structure is basically the same, right? In all, all the cases, there's an interface, there's a node interface, and then there's a head node, and a regular node, and a tail node. Or there's a, in the decorator, there's a component, right, and a concrete component, and then the decorator, interface and then concrete interfaces and chain responsibility right there's an interface and then each decorator and we chain them together compose them together and we then send messages down and back right and they're slightly different in the sense of right the decorator right we, we send it all the way down the, the base one and it comes back and things in between may or may not modify the request um, and the chain usually, usually we just have one thing, handles it, and we're done. And object recursion, right? It's sort of they saw the link list, it may go all the way to the bottom, and each each thing does something, um, or it may stop in the middle because it found the right spot to add or delete things. And so they're fairly similar.
So I saw my earlier question, I asked you a question. Is the stream the best operator or have we found another way to do things like no. So in Java streams, right, we, we combine them together, right? Um, and normally the request goes all the way to end and back again, right? So if it's a read stream, you've got the file stream, and then you may have a, um, a buffer stream, right? Mm -hmm. The streams where, where you give it a list, just a list of elements, yes. and then you can do the, the dot for or the dot map, like you do in Python. Because every time you call another function, it returns you another stream interface. It looks right. just the same as the one you had, right. only now it has to add it on. Start. Sort of like this. Well, but you're yeah, you're sending data through this pipe, right? So I don't know, I'm kind of let me skip over all this and we'll come back to this later. Uh, yeah. Really faster to Pipes and filters. Um, so one reason I asked earlier if anyone does Unix is in Unix you you have all these little utilities, and then you just create this pipeline, right? And so the output of one is the input of the other, right? Which is the same thing you talk about in Java streams, right? The output of one of those, you have this, this pipeline and you pass the you pass the data into the first one, right? And then it does something to the data and then it passes the result on the next one. Presumably. Yeah. Just the way it's set up, it's kind of. Yeah. It's more uh, declarative so you don't really see what it's doing. You just kind of change all these, you chain all these function calls Right. It's presumably just create under the hood this stream of stream of operations. This, this pipeline. This pipe, yeah. But you don't really ever get to see it. Yeah, but basically you take this this one element and you pass it the first one and it does <laughs> No, but that's what happens, right? Presumably, yeah. The same thing happens here, right? I mean it's just how does LS send this data to grep? Yeah, but there's all that mechanism, right? And what does that mean? How do you connect it to, right? Well, there's some little, the pipe creates a little process where it's, you know, it's, it's pulling data from the input and passing it on the output, right? And so the same thing's happening in these, these streams, right? So there's something that's pulling data from the source and pushing it into, right, that first, thing in your list and then it goes to the next one, next one, next one. When you're when you're calling it through their API, you know, it's almost more like you're adding a decorator to each yeah. each previous thing. Yeah, you are creating this this I mean there's a decorator and a chain responsibility and all recursion and now Python filters are all very similar and we're we're basically creating this chain, right? And we then, in the latter example, we're passing data into the first thing, right? And then it does something to data and it gets passed in the next one. 
whereas in the chain responsibility and all recursion, we're calling we're calling a function, right? And these functions are doing things. So in these Python filters, we're just we've got a chain of things, and the first one is producing some sort of data, and it passes the next one, and the next one transforms the data. So the difference here is we have a chain of operations, but we're passing data as opposed to calling functions. All right. And so you just break into small pieces, right? And then you can combine these pieces together. And that's what you're doing in the Java streams, right? It's like here's my, my input my input source, and then I do a map and a filter and reduce another map, right? And so the nodes in the chain in the Python filters become operations as opposed to calling a function on something. If you take one, just, just take one element in the string right. and just look at it on its own, right. you're still, you're going through a loop of, you're going through kind of a for each of the functions. Saying, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. It seems like that's the same. Underlying idea is almost identical, right? Um, implementation is different, right? As you said, right, and the chain responsibility is clear. I call a function, right? I see what I'm doing, and then I, I know on this object, you can call the same function on this guy, right? As you pointed out in Java streams, you don't see the underlying mechanism, right? And what and each element that you, you're combining is just a function, right? It's a map, it's a filter, it's reduced, it's... Under the hood, they probably all have the same interface, right? Give me something. Yeah, and it's just like, just, just like... like with your own. Pass me something in, I'll work on it. Yeah, and the, and the only difference is in other recursion, I'm calling a function, right? Whereas in the pipes and filters, we have a node which inputs, accepts data, raw data. So your, your, the difference for you is that. Well, yeah, in, in one case, we're calling a function to, to do it. In the other case, the actual node is a function. It's map. This is the function. Yeah. This is not, I don't, I don't get that. I mean, there's, they're both state, if they're state, I mean, the functions obviously be stateless. No, the functions don't have to be stateless either, but. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, to me, the difference is, um, you know, pipes and filters, right? You've got a data source and a pipe just transmits the data, right? Um, and each filter does something. Um, and there's various examples of doing this. In all cases, we're creating this chain, right? And, you know, the, the chain builds up the dynamically we build up this larger operation, right? Um, and in one, conceptually we're just passing data through. We're not calling it a function directly, right? And in chain responsibility, there could be 10 different functions I can call on that initial object. And your streams example is, is basically all you can do is enter data. These underlying mechanisms like this pipe and filters that we take the data from one, output from one and pass it in, and that's the input to the next function. Oh, yeah, basically, in your example, all that's happening is I have a data source, right? Here's, a, here's my array, 
And then I have a map and then I filter and reduce, right, in this chain, this stream. And so you take the data and you pass it, you pass the first element of the array and pass it to the first function of map. It does something to it. Takes, and this output is then transferred, or transmitted to the next element function. So just typing your search terms in for the first element. Right, right. Right, right, yeah. I mean, the concepts are very, very similar. That's why I have them in the same lectures. Like, these are all basically the same idea, but there's subtle differences. And they all have certain attributes in common, right? Um, one is we're taking a bigger picture and we're buying a small little pieces, right? In the obvious obvi recursion example, a linked list, I mean, I created a head node and a tail node that represent just basically nothing, right? And they just do a little, small little things. In your example, right, I mean, we're we're trying to transform data in a certain way, and if we, we do it in small little steps where it's easier to see what's going on, so I can, I can map it and I can reduce it and maybe another map and I can filter in various orders, um, and we can bind them together to, to get the result we want. So in both cases, we're, we're taking a larger problem and breaking into small little pieces and doing one one little thing, one little thing, right? And you can say we're famous for that, right? You just you got this whole big, huge, long list of small little functions you do, and you with grep and set and arc, you can do amazing things. Yeah, they're very similar, right? Because again, you're you're starting with a, a collection of some data source, right? And then you pass it to a function and transform those elements in some way and then pass it on the next and next and next, right? And you know, people in functional programming are doing that for decades, right? Just you create these chain of functions. And I've written several applications using closure, and that's a very common thing you do. Like, okay, you write a bunch of smaller functions, and you just chain it together, and you just here's here's your input data, and just, and here's here's the result you want. And so it's map and reduce, and then this and this and this and this, and here's the answer. I think all these are, you know, powerful tools. Um, that you really want to keep track of in your head, like, oh, I can, how can I break these problems into smaller little pieces and then combine them? Yeah, it's different now, procedurally. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's nice because then when you do it all at once, it's like this big, huge thing is complicated, right? But when you break it into smaller pieces, each piece is um, easier to understand and implement. And, it, you know, I tend to. You know, the size, um, um, complexity, right? 
And usually things, you know, it's not a linear process, right? It, as you think it's bigger and bigger, the, comp the complexity and difficult difficulty to deal with it gets, isn't just linear. If you double the size, it's not just twice as hard, it's more than twice as hard, right? And so it's it's much easier, it's much better to spend more time, as much time as you can down here, right? So if I can break things into small little pieces and then use those to compose our solution, it's better than trying to create one big thing over here. And that's, right, the, the pipes and filters, is a, the Unix is full of these small little, they're all little things, right? They do one thing and then combine together. The streams are like that too. I try to radius of the ball of the amount. Right. The amount of work I have. One, you know, exactly, right, right. The bigger the application gets, eventually longer it takes to right. make something else. Right. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the surface area gets bigger and bigger, right? So, you know, that's why initially it seems like you're making big, pro great progress, right? Because it's going really fast. But and then, no, you're going at the same speed. The problem is the surface area is growing bigger, right? Well, next time we'll talk about the null object pattern, which is the pattern about objects you do, don't do anything. Um, you should understand each pattern. Um, you should definitely understand the goal of each pattern. Um, you'll notice that the YOMO, at some point, there's not as many YOMO diagrams as you think because there's like, oh, let's see, the decorator pattern. Oh, how's that? Oh, yes. Um, I need a decorator interface and I need the right, concrete thing and then the decorator. I mean, if we look at if you do look at my past exams, and I, my exams don't change drastically from year to year. They, they change. Same What's that? Same questions. <laughs> I've actually done that and been surprised at at the results. <laughs> so if I just memorize B, C, B, A, that might not work. That might not work, no. Uh, all I have to do is do a slight permutation of one shift, right? And then you're... <laughs>